As pessoas e o mundo estão a mudar. Gostamos de coisas diferentes, mas apesar de tudo aquilo que às vezes parece afastar-nos, há algo que nos aproxima. O acreditarmos hoje num amanhã mais positivo. O Grupo Crédito Agrícola reconhece o seu papel fundamental para se atingir uma economia mais sustentável e inclusiva. Queremos ajudar as pessoas e as empresas a estarem preparadas para os desafios da sustentabilidade. É por isso que somos pelas gerações e comunidades dos dias que hão de vir. Crédito Agrícola. Um compromisso com o futuro. So let's, so let's, so let's enter the third topic of the morning. Regenerative business, green swans. John Elkington is the founder and chief of Volans and will join us from uh, the UK. He is the author of the book, uh, The Black Swans. And uh, now there is a new book, The Green Swans, uh, that explains how business can uh, regenerate the planet. John Elkington guide us uh, through the, uh, this interesting and uh, uh, key point. Good morning. Thank you, Pedro. Can everyone hear me? I'm assuming that you can hear me in that case. Um, so it's, it's wonderful to be part of this uh, extraordinary um, conference and I now know what I want for Christmas, which is uh, a, a nice little fusion plant for my own home, a cryostat. So um, if anyone's got one free, uh, I'd love to see that. So what I'm going to do is very quickly take you through some background on the Green Swans uh, proposition. Uh, Nassim Nicholas Taleb is the one who uh, did the Black Swan book. I'll come on to him in a moment. But um, so if I could have the first slide, please. So one of the things that's been happening, uh, and I'm sure any of you have been calling people in places like California recently, uh, you will find that uh, their skies are red, the landscapes beyond their uh, bedroom windows are on fire. It's an extraordinary uh, time in our collective uh, history. So um, that's the bad news. Um, here's some possibly even worse news, uh, which is that uh, the gap between where we are headed at the moment in terms of uh, greenhouse gas emissions and where we would need to be uh, is absolutely huge uh, between that, and let's say, a 1.5 degree uh, pathway. And anyone who has um, studied science fiction in recent times will have seen some very interesting uh, new books, fictional books, on, on where this might take us. One of the most uh, shocking is American War, uh, which posits or predicts that uh, sometime in, later in the century, the United States uh, will descend into civil war over fossil fuels in the same way that it once did on slavery. Now, I'm not making any forecasts, but given what's been happening in the United States recently, it's not beyond uh, imagination. Let me just kick off very quickly by saying who I am and where I fit into a, a wider uh, world. So um, I'm a baby boomer. Um, I've been involved in the environmental and sustainability fields for over 40 years. Um, I've set up uh, four what we'd now call social businesses since 1978. They all still uh, exist. I have three visiting professorships. I've sat on or served on uh, over 70 boards or advisory boards. And I've just uh, published my 20th uh, book, which Pedro uh, kindly uh, referenced. Uh, it's called Green Swans, uh, and the subtitle is The Coming Boom in Regenerative Capitalism. Uh, and as I, I'll make clear as I go through, uh, Green Swans are in the future for us. I think there are some already in existence. Problem is there are a lot of black swans uh, too, and I'll come into some examples of those. But the book, for example, talks about uh, plastics in the ocean. It talks about uh, the obesity pandemic around the world, which is uh, creating problems in terms of chronic disease and particularly diabetes and the climate emergency and the biodiversity emergency uh, also um, stacking up uh, on the horizon. So just a, a, again, a little bit uh, of background. I, 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 if I'm known for anything, it's for the triple bottom line, which I, uh, which I uh, introduced about 25 uh, years ago. And um, 
one of the things that uh, that was based on uh, was the notion that in boardrooms of the future, uh, we would need to have different voices around the table. So in addition to the obvious ones, the CEO and chief operating officer and CFO and so on, we would need a voice for nature, the natural world. We need a voice for uh, the social uh, agenda. And slightly humorously, there was a robot there as well. Uh, and that the idea there was this was a voice for the long term. And as some of you will know, the first expert system was appointed to a board in Hong Kong in 2014. So that, that future is looking a little less unlikely than it once would have done. So that, that, that served a purpose. And we had uh, the Global Reporting Initiative and the Dow Jones Sustainability Indexes and uh, B Corporations and so on, all inspired by the triple bottom line. But uh, in a couple of years ago, I recalled did the first ever product recall of a management concept uh, through the Harvard uh, Business Review. And I'm now going on not to explain why exactly, but to say, say some of the things that have happened uh, since. None of this means that what people like the B Corporation movement are doing is unimportant. I think it's essential. I think it's crucial, really, really uh, important. Um, and at the same time, you're seeing some very major uh, business, uh, media and institutions starting to raise the question as to whether uh, capitalism itself uh, is in need of a reset. So this was the Financial Times about 18 months uh, ago. There's increasing uh, sense that Milton Friedman's thinking over the last 50 years uh, has been important and influential, uh, but uh, slightly myopic, slightly limited in its um, focus on uh, business rather than government and business, uh, and a focus on a single uh, bottom line. And I think we may well be coming to the end of that uh, Friedman uh, period uh, in uh, business thinking. And just a couple of weeks ago in the New York Times, marking the 50th anniversary of Friedman's uh, um, uh, manifesto way through the newspaper, uh, you had Imperative 21, a coalition of organizations around the world, uh, launching a very different uh, agenda, multi-dimensional forms uh, of value. I won't go through them all uh, here in the interests of time, uh, but I think this is a very interesting milestone uh, campaign. And in a moment, we'll hear from Jeff Kendall. Uh, Future Fit Foundation have been exploring this agenda and specifically coming up with tools for uh, businesses that want to engage uh, effectively. And he may well use a diagram like this, but just simply to say, we've gone from a period where different forms of value were disaggregated to a period where shared value and, and propositions like that became increasingly uh, mainstream. And there was a degree of overlapping between these different forms of value. And I think what FutureFit are saying is now we need to go to a nested set of circles. So business and uh, markets and capitalism sit uh, in their view at the heart of all of this, but around them and crucial are society and the wider uh, natural uh, environment. So this is a paradigm shift in a way, in the way we think about all of this. So an obvious question is, has the pandemic killed off the whole sustainability uh, agenda? My simple answer is going to be, no, it hasn't. In fact, I think it's given it quite a, a major boost. Uh, but it has had massive uh, uh, impacts on uh, our world. Uh, and the Gates Foundation just a few weeks back uh, just made the, the point that in 25 weeks up to that point, 25 years worth of development had basically been uh, wiped out. So we're in a pretty grim situation and we've got to keep, bear that in mind as we uh, move uh, forward. And in a way, uh, the way, the way I think about it is this is not simply a moment in time where we're going to see U-shaped or V-shaped or W-shaped or K-shaped or whatever um, uh, recoveries. Recoveries will come, but there's a much, much bigger uh, process underway. I think we're we're moving through a point in our history where um, macroeconomics and geopolitics come together, and a reality which we've all grown up in and, and largely, I think, benefited from, is starting to unravel. Will that stop anytime soon? No, I don't think it will. In, in, if anything, I think it's going to accelerate. So this is an extraordinary time uh, uh, in history, uh, but I also think it's actually strangely uh, one of the biggest opportunities that we've ever 
uh, had. And COVID-19 has actually, in my view, uh, accelerated this uh, quite uh, profoundly. So ESG, Environment, Social and Governance uh, Investments, getting a, a lot of attention in the media around the world uh, now, very exciting. Um, uh, and the different components of the ESG agenda are uh, evolving all the time. So if you think about uh, the, the, um, the, the, the social uh, agenda, a huge number of issues have sort of scrambled into the priority list. Uh, Black Lives Matter among them, um, uh, but many others as well. And we're starting to see under the economic uh, heading and governance, we're seeing uh, growing interest in uh, you know, wealth divides. Uh, we're seeing growing interest in tax evasion and tax uh, ha havens and so on. So th this agenda is evolving uh, the whole time. And we still have absolute idiocies where companies, and in this case Rio Tinto, as many of you will know, blew up Aboriginal caves going back something like 46,000 years. And we can pretty much guarantee uh, those sorts of stupidities will uh, continue. But at the same time, you're starting to see some really interesting uh, uh, commitments uh, from business. Just a few weeks ago, for example, Walmart, the CEO of uh, Walmart, declared a commitment uh, for that company to become a regenerative company. So this is no longer just about responsibility or about resilience. This is about regenerating the systems on which we uh, depend. And I do think that that is very much uh, part of the emerging agenda for the future. I think, uh, we think this is going to be an exponent, exponential decade. Let's me very quickly explain why. Uh, and it's very interesting that younger people are picking up on this ahead of uh, you know their their parents and uh, uh, older people and i think that is what often happens uh, in these periods of intense uh, disruption and one of the things that we've seen in working with companies around the world is that they embrace the sustainable development goals they want to do their bit towards their delivery by 2030 but often they fail to understand the nature of those goals they think they can pick a few uh, deliver their little bit against that and that'll be fine if you just look at the first two uh, global goals, uh, no poverty, zero hunger, even if you push those out to 2060 or 2070, those would still be exponential goals. And yet we're being asked to deliver those by uh, 2030 and with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and likely recession beyond that uh, factored and on top of that. So already the UN has in a way gone uh, exponential. Uh, and the problem with all of this is that our brains weren't designed to operate uh, exponentially. Uh, they operate incrementally, largely. There are a few people who can uh, think about uh, fusion reactions or other forms of sort of exponential uh, dynamics. But uh, for most of us, this is uh, quite a big uh, stretch. And one of the things that we're doing at the moment is starting to look around the world for examples of initiatives, technologies, uh, business models, uh, policy measures that could over time scramble. So in a sense, ugly ducklings, things that at the moment look weird because they, you know, we're not used to uh, those sorts of things, but over time could well uh, scale and become uh, part of our future in a pretty major way. And it may well be that uh, Fusion Power is, is one of those uh, uh, ugly ducklings. Let me just say a few words quickly about uh, the swan uh, metaphor. I mentioned Nassim Nicholas Taleb. Um, he uh, published his book, The Black Swan, in 2007, as you will all know. Many of you will have read the book. This was just before uh, the financial crash of 2007-2008. And the points he made at the time uh, were that uh, black swans are complete surprises. They come out of the blue. Um, they have an extreme impact and after the event, we look back and think we've understood what's just happened to us. And very often we don't understand it properly. And therefore we're setting ourselves up uh, for failure again. Now he's been asked uh, repeatedly as to whether COVID-19 uh, is a black swan. And his view is absolutely not because we saw it coming or at least quite a number of people saw the risk of pandemics. Units were set up in my own country, the UK. We had a, a, a project Cygnus set up by the uh, government, the findings were, uh, and it, it showed that we were very ill prepared and the findings were ignored uh, by government. There are, there are somewhat similar examples from other uh, countries. But I want to go on to 
the inverse, the reverse in a way of black swans. Black swans largely take us where we don't want to go and do that exponentially. Question, what would it look like if we started to move exponentially where we did want to go towards uh, sustainability or whatever we describe that as uh, being? So we set up a, an observatory to uh, track uh, related developments in different parts of the world. One thing we were saying to people uh, is a green swan is not an individual. There are plenty of people already uh, trying to call themselves green swans. Um, there are plenty of companies now beginning to do that as well. But for us, a green swan is a market shift. Uh, and, and so a company or an individual can play into that, but it's a much, much bigger um, element in the, in the landscape. And if I'm asked to give a, an example, I would say the Green Deal in uh, the European Union is potentially at least one example. Uh, so what last time I looked at the numbers, it was about 1.82 uh, trillion uh, euros playing into the uh, inclusive green uh, recovery. I, I'm always slightly mistrusting of very large numbers put out by the European Union. Nonetheless, I think this is exactly the level of ambition uh, that we need to see uh, in whatever comes next. And then at the same time, I, we, we all know it, that technologies, some of them at least, particularly in spaces like energy, transportation, and even in areas like uh, cattle ranching and dairy um, uh, farming, uh, the exponential uh, trajectories are really coming in uh, very powerfully now. In, I mentioned cattle ranching and, and, and uh, dairying. Well, that's through precision fermentation. And if people haven't read the series of books, sorry, the reports that have come out of Rethink X based in uh, Silicon Valley in London, I do recommend those very highly uh, indeed. And the problem with all new technologies, uh, as history has repeatedly shown, is that there will be, let's call them black feathers, even on the greenest of green swans. Uh, and I, I'm just going to very quickly take the example of wind power. I could equally take solar, where you know, the, the solar technology that has powered the last 20 or 30 years is coming to the end of its useful life. Having to, We don't know how to do that properly. These are pretty toxic uh, uh, products. And um, the same is true with wind power. Uh, the veins, the rotors, uh, uh, are very, very difficult, if not impossible, uh, to recycle. Perhaps we should have thought of that uh, earlier on. So moving towards a conclusion, um, uh, where are we headed? Uh, I'm an optimist. It may not always sound like it. I, I actually think that um, uh, the, the future can be radically better, dramatically better from the way we uh, currently <laughs> uh, are imagining it and possibly even beginning to experience it. And I do think one of the big challenges for people in business and in the investment world will increasingly to talk, talk the language of uh, impact. And, and we see impact investment uh, evolving very, very rapidly at something like $500 billion uh, in value now, still relatively small compared to trillions sluicing through financial markets uh, every year. But if anyone hasn't come across uh, Sir Ronnie Cohen's book on impact, very highly uh, recommended. I think this is a language we're all going to get our brains around, or have to get our brains around, and learn how to uh, speak. Just um, in, in recent months, we've been working with a, a Spanish company, Acciona, and uh, one of the things that uh, we've been doing there is helping, in their case, um, 27 fast-track uh, younger people across the company, and this is very much a global uh, group, to embrace not just responsibility, not just the resilience agenda, but regeneration. Uh, and it's, you know, it's been fascinating to see how these younger people have embraced uh, that uh, agenda. When I talk about regeneration, I'm not simply talking about environmental or urban regeneration, although th those are important. I'm talking about social regeneration. I'm even talking about economic and political uh, regeneration. And so we've got to bring forward uh, the next generation and actually accelerate uh, that process, by which I don't mean we dump all of this in their lap. We've got to help them. We've got to invest in them. Uh, we've got to support them in every way, which way we uh, can. But just towards a, a, a conclusion, I think we're moving into, and this is part of the exponential decay notion, a period where people begin to wake up uh, to the scale of the crisis that we've got ourselves into. And, and you start to see, uh, in this case, uh, a carbon panic at some point in this decade. Uh, people will try and get out of car carbon heavy investments at speed. And we always all, all know what happens uh, when that 
uh, begins, uh, you know, it, it, it's pretty bloody. It's pretty uh, messy. This image shows um, two people who have benefited enormously from uh, fossil fuels, Rex Tillerson on the left from ExxonMobil back in the day. And a number of um, uh, governments around the world have also benefited hugely from uh, uh, fossil fuels. They're going to have to get used to getting uh, over that addiction very fast indeed, I think, and much quicker. And it's actually happening. And, and just uh, again, a couple of weeks ago, you saw ExxonMobil's uh, valuation uh, overtaken by a, a renewables company, uh, NextEra Energy. And it's been extraordinary to see ExxonMobil lose about two thirds of its value. Uh, in the last sort of 18 months uh, or so. Final slide, I think. And this is just saying uh, we're coming out of a reality which, as I've said, is post-World War II. We've all grown up in it. We've all taken it for granted. Uh, and it's a world in which responsibility has been uh, a driving motivation for what we've done in relation to business uh, and markets. We're now at a point where despite all of that work on responsibility and shared value and all the rest of it, uh, if you listen to leaders in politics and business and finance, they're talking about resilience. And the reason is the systems on which we rely are beginning to uh, weaken, in some cases, uh, unravel. Uh, and that's not going to end. As I say, I think that is probably going to uh, accelerate. And many people are acting as if you can just wish resilience into being just by talking about it and, 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 and by putting it in your annual reports and so on, somehow magically it will happen. I don't believe that. I think the only way to guarantee or, or ensure uh, longer term resilience in all of the multiple systems on which we're uh, reliant is to invest in them. And that's where regeneration and the regeneration mindset that Walmart and others have begun to signal comes in. Uh, so powerfully. But along the way, there will be a growing number of black swans, which we will have to uh, rein in. And that's where I think global governance, which again is weakening in, in many ways, uh, is going to become even more uh, important, uh, not less. So I'm going to stop uh, there, hand back to uh, Pedro and, and see if we can then sort of move the session with uh, Jeff Kendall. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you so much, John, uh, for your words. Uh, but don't go away because we still have time. And I think that uh, we can stress one or two things that uh, you've already uh, spoken in. I think it was very interesting. So uh, uh, why do you really think that uh, COVID-19 is really an opportunity? Uh, let us stress that, please. Well, I think it's an opportunity if we... I'm hearing a lot of feedback, but let me continue anyway. Um, it's an opportunity because it's been like a whack to the side of the head. Uh, people have heard about systemic crises. They've been briefed and formed on them for a very long time. And suddenly they can see the nature of the future world, where everything is linked to everything else. So wildlife trafficking, and people digging out back caves, uh, and hospital systems, and transport systems, all conspire uh, to create uh, this uh, pandemic. Well, that's a small uh, uh, example of what we're going to experience in the next few decades with uh, the climate emergency and so on. So I think it's useful in the sense that it's waking people up. But then the question is, do we have the sort of leadership that will take us uh, forward in a constructive uh, way? I think it will emerge. I don't think most current leaders have it in them uh, to deal with this new reality. So it's a big wake up and things will never be the same. It's time to make a change right now and take this opportunity. I believe so. And uh, uh, you've also mentioned one, uh, uh, one thing that uh, uh, has been keeping in, on my mind ever since. Uh, you've talked about the Green Deal in Europe. How, um, how big can it be? How optimistic you are when you are uh, uh, in UK and UK is uh, uh, leaving Europe? Yeah. Well, I don't, I don't think that uh, the UK can leave uh, Europe, but it, it can try to leave the uh, European Union. My own hope is that at some stage we will come back. Mm -hmm. um, but for the moment, I think uh, what's happened in my country is an example of the political polarization, 
which always comes at this sort of time in an economic cycle when people become fearful that an old order, an old reality is falling apart and they cling on to the, uh, in their minds, glorious uh, past. So um, I, I, I think uh, the Green Deal uh, hopefully will work, but what attracts me to it is it brings together the economic, the social and the environmental uh, components in an integrated uh, way. And I think that's, that's important and potentially quite exciting. So it's not a uh, definite goodbye. And uh, Europe has a chance with the Green Deal to, trans to lead the transformation in the world. Yeah, I don't. I think Europe is actually sliding behind in a lot of this, despite the uh, Green Deal. And in a way, you see, if you look at China and you look at some parts of the United States, for example, uh, technology and business innovation is moving at a much faster rate, despite what we heard uh, earlier on uh, today. And I, you know, I, I hope that we will see almost a renaissance uh, in Europe, whereas at the moment, what we see is people again sort of clinging on to uh, a, a glorious uh, past. So I, I think the next 10 to 15 years are going to be extraordinarily exciting, extraordinarily challenging, and in some ways politically more dangerous than any point in, 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 in certainly in, in, in my lifetime. Um, so I, I'm an optimist, so I think we can, we can make sense of this. I think new leaders will spring up. I think business has an incredibly important role to play in taking a lead. And I think Europe can uh, re-establish its role uh, in the world over time. So my fingers are very much crossed. 10 to 15 years, that will be uh, very exciting. Uh, I'm positive about it, but also very decisive. Thank you so much, John Elkington. A big applause to John. And uh, you will be staying with us. Thank you. Thank you all.